If you were to uh, grab a dictionary in the 1970s and look up the word loser, it would have had uh, my picture. <laughs> Apart from the time that my dad tried to get me drunk when I was about six years old, because uh, he was up to something with some lady in our kitchen, and I, I thought something wasn't right, and he, uh, he forced me to drink a rather large cup of whiskey. And I remember uh, vomiting that entire night. But apart from that, I started drinking on my own when I was in eighth grade. And ironically enough, it was my dad's whiskey that I started drinking. <laughs> then I went into high school and I started getting drunk on a regular basis just about every uh, weekend. I came out of the Navy and Brother Ashby introduced me to marijuana. That's a lovely brother. <laughs> And it took, me, it took me a while for it to have some effect on me, but once it did, I was absolutely addicted. I smoked every day for almost eight years. Sometimes it made me feel incredibly depressed, and I tried time and time again to stop, and I just could not do it. One time, I thought I had some uh, weed tucked away in my uh, dresser drawer for an emergency, and I had a friend who I was buying it from, but he had a delay in getting it to me, so I thought, well, no problem. I'll just get that little stash I have in my drawer, but it wasn't there. I had smoked it before, and I literally tore our bedroom apart. I was like a scene out of some addict uh, movie. I took all the drawers out. I dumped everything. I went in the closet. I pulled everything out I could find. I just had to get high, but I couldn't. And I felt so ashamed of myself, and I wished I could quit, but I just could not do that. I did come close one time. A friend of mine sold me some uh, marijuana. When he sold it to me, he said, you're going to like this. He said, it's thought weed. I said, what do you mean by thought weed? He said, you'll find out. So I took that, and I had a friend of mine lived in the same apartment complex that I did. I was still living with my parents. I was in my early 20s. This fellow had an uh, apartment that he lived in with his girlfriend, and he told me that he and his girlfriend were going out one night and that I could use his uh, apartment and go over there and get high and listen to music. I thought that sounded like heaven. So I went over there and I smoked a joint of thought weed. And at the time, there was a fellow that I grew up with, George Stapleton. He had a brother named Don. His brother Don had killed somebody and was in prison, but he had escaped. And so after smoking that one joint, I got it into my head that I was the escaped murderer. And I believed that with all my heart. So I was walking toward the bathroom in my friend's house. Bedroom door was open, and I looked, glanced inside the bedroom, and I saw all kinds of bodies piled on the bed. So I walked in there and I was putting my hands on the bed and I realized the bed was unmade. It was just an hallucination and I'm, I'm trying to calm myself down. So I convinced myself this is just sheets. I'm imagining things. So I was walking back out of his room and I got this compulsion to turn around and I turned around and the bodies were back. I left his house, went home, woke up the next day. And I got to thinking that I had killed my friend and his girlfriend. Back then, they had phones that were attached to the house. <laughs> so I was calling and calling and calling like 15 minutes. Every 15 minutes, I'm calling, you know, Ed, I want you to answer, answer this phone, man. So I'm just calling and calling. He never answers. So sometime around noon, I decided I got to go over there, and I just started beating on his apartment door, and I'm beating and beating and beating and beating, and he's not answering, and I'm beating and I'm beating. He finally opened the door, and I said, Ed, man, I can kiss you. He said, what in the world's wrong with you? I said, I thought I may have killed you and your girlfriend. He said, well, you need to do something with your, about yourself. <laughs> I took that ounce of pot, I dumped it in the toilet, and I flushed it, and I was determined I'm not going to get, get uh, high or drunk again. That was, that was it. I'm finished. Now, Ashby had given me a set of uh, stereo headphones, and at the time, this was, this was like the ultimate gift you could give anybody. 
So when I get the urge, I would put the headphones on and I'd just start walking. Sometimes I could walk for an hour and a half. And I recall that lasted about a month. And one day I got walking, I decided to take a different route. And I meandered through some streets. And when I came, came out of, into the open, there was this bar. Headphones on, I walked to the bar and sat in there the rest of the day. It was a feeling of complete helplessness. I better read it from here. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do I do not do, but what I hate I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. Raise your hand if as a Christian you have ever felt you've experienced what Paul is mentioning there. I see a lot of hands. Now historically there have been two views of the meaning of this passage. One is it describes a typical Christian struggle with sin. And number two is it describes the life of the unbeliever. And I want to make a relatively simple argument with the limited time we have that number two is the correct way to understand this passage. Now you might be thinking, what difference does it make? But if you think about that for a moment, you realize it makes a tremendous amount of difference. When I was being studied with before I became a Christian, it meant the world to me that the guys I was studying with were telling me that in Christ you do not have to live like this any longer. And I can guarantee you, if I would have met people who would have told me that the only thing Jesus is going to give you is salvation at some future time, I would have said, nice meeting you guys, but no thanks. Paul had this to say in writing to the Corinthian church. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. <coughs> now imagine for a moment that scenario number one is actually what Paul meant in Romans 7. He would have rewritten this passage like this. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you are. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Can't you just feel the hope draining 
out of anyone if Paul would have written that instead of what he actually wrote. Hey, drug addict, don't expect that miserable life you're living to ever change. But won't it be wonderful when the consummation arrives? Hey, adulterer, don't you worry about the ruined lives and homes. You're going to live that way the, until you die. But hey, won't it be great to see the Lord? And thief, well, sorry about that. There's nothing you can do to change. Maybe you won't get caught. But won't it be wonderful when ultimately you're walking through those pearly gates? In fact, the whole concept of repentance is meaningless if scenario number one is in play. So what's going on here? Why all the confusion? Well, the confusion comes in misunderstanding the structure of Paul's argument in Romans 7 and Romans 8. Paul says, For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us so that we bore fruit for death. But now, by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Verse 5 depicts the pre-Christian experience. Paul talks about being in the realm of the flesh. But all that changes in verse 6. Paul says, but now. He says, you've been released. He said, you've died to what once bound you. And he refers to the Spirit. Now virtually all commentators agree that verse 5 in this passage refers to unbelievers and verse 6 to believers. And that is the key point. Romans chapter 7, verses 7 through 25, unpacks verse 5. And Romans 8, chapters 1 through 17, unpacks verse 6. In verses 7 through 25, we see how sin via the law brings death to those who are in the flesh. But in Romans 8, 1 through 17, we see how the Spirit grants life to those who are in Christ. This passage here forecasts what Paul is going to elaborate on in the following passages very clearly. And we can look at this passage from another perspective. Chapter 7, verses 7 through 25, the Holy Spirit is never once mentioned. And in just the first 17 verses of chapter 8, the Holy Spirit is mentioned 15 times. This suggests that the one spoken of in 7, 7 through 25 does not have the Spirit of God, whereas the one spoken of in chapter 8 most definitely does. In fact, the essence of being a Christian is being indwelt by God's Spirit as Paul says in Romans 8 9, those who do not have the Spirit of Christ do not belong to Christ. But I know you guys are all pretty uh, smart, at least maybe not my brother, but I know most of you are. <laughs> so I'm sure you're asking yourself the question, well, if, that, if that's the interpretation of that passage, why did so many Christians raise their hand at the beginning of this class when I asked the question? And as Ashby said uh, this morning, glad you asked. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. 
If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. Paul's talking about total depravity. He's not talking about the day-to-day battles that we have with sin. Losing my place. (laughs) As Christians, we will battle the enemy day in and day out, but we are not slaves any longer to sin. We are not under his total dominion. As Christians, we enjoy substantial and significant and observable changes in our lives. Although not perfect, the changes can be seen. We are dramatically changed by the grace of God. If you take every Christian in this room, warts and all, even the ones who raise their hands, we are all so much more like Christ than we were at the beginning. You can ask my brother what a filthy, speaking human being I was growing up. I wrote a letter to a friend of mine when I was in the Navy, and he saved it because there were, there were curse words in every sentence. And I've been married 34 years. My daughter's 32 years old. My son's 27 years old. They have never once heard me cuss. And they will tell you that. And they have never once seen me intoxicated on booze or weed. I want to leave us with this thought. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And God's promise is that by the power of His Spirit, we can attain that goal. A remarkable march toward that goal in this life, and ultimately, perfection at the consummation. Thank you.